Well, this is kind of weird, isn't it? I am here in our beloved sanctuary all by myself. I look out and I can almost see your faces here. I know where you sit. I know where you live. But I also know that you are taking care of yourselves and that you are also well taken care of. For that I am thankful. Thankful also that we live in a place in time where we have all the disinfectant that we need, all of the information that we need, and hopefully even all of the toilet paper that we need until we are once again able to worship together here in this space. We can also be thankful that we can worship together virtually. So, let us begin, as we always do, with our confession and forgiveness in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. We now pray the prayer of the day, and I wish you had an insert along with me, but please pray with me anyway. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, our scripture readings for today are, some of them are a little bit long, so I'm not going to read them all. The first lesson is from the Old Testament and book of Ezekiel, and it is the story of Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. God commanded him to prophesy, and before his eyes, God brought these dry, dry bones to life. This story is found in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. When I think of this story, I always think of that old spiritual song, Dem Bone, Dem Bones, Dem Dry Bones. So I'm going to share the link with you so that you can listen to it with your kiddos. Our psalm is Psalm 130. This psalm is what we call a psalm of lament. It is a psalm written at a time when things weren't exactly going hunky-dory for the people of Israel. You'll notice that the psalmist ends, however, with a sure and certain hope that God is still God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. Wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Our second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. Um, I'm not going to read that one either, so I invite you to look it up 
after our little worship service this morning. Again, that is Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. And now our gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O God. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you there. Are you going again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he saw that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died, but now, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how, they loved, how he loved them. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been there for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him. And let him go. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> well, today's Gospel reading is another long one. It actually is considered part of a trilogy, the last 
of three theologically important stories, Jesus healing the blind man, revealing himself to the Samaritan woman at the well, and now raising the dead. Together, these accounts emphasize Jesus coming into his own, taking on the full mantle of Messiah, Son of God and Son of Man, which will lead him to the cross very soon. In fact, there are rumblings of danger in today's reading. As I said, it's a, a long scripture, but I'll bet you didn't know it contains the shortest verse in the Bible. Yep, yeah. John 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Well, okay, the translation I read says, Jesus began to weep. But in the old King James Version, and in, and in several other ones, it simply says two words, Jesus wept. Now, I wish I could say I found this from extensive research on the text, but alas, this bit of trivia came from another source. Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain's classic novel about growing up in pre-Civil War South. You may remember Tom Sawyer was a bit of a brilliant rascal, and when he had to memorize a Bible verse for his Sunday school, this is the one he came up with. So just an aside, if my current or future confirmation students are listening, I will give you credit for this verse. Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Let's do a little recap of the story to see if we can figure it out. Jesus was very good friends with Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus. I'm sure many of you remember the story of Martha working frantically in the kitchen to get food on the table and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet listening. When she complained to Jesus, he told Martha that Mary was doing the important thing, making us all feel guilty because we know we are far too often Martha's. But somebody has to do with the kicking and the cleaning after all. This particular scripture says that Mary was also the woman who spent a whole bunch of money on perfume to anoint Jesus' feet. While Mary was performing this selfless act, I imagine Martha was at home trying to figure out where her grocery money went. Judas took the heat for this, though. He criticized Mary, saying the money was wasted and could have been used to feed many people. Jesus defended Mary again, telling Jesus, telling Judas, she will always have the poor. We'll puzzle that one out another time. So let's move forward. Lazarus was very, very ill, and the sisters sent word to Jesus. Now, they knew Jesus. They had followed him. They had seen his miracles. They knew that he was a healer and also that he loved them, so they were sure that he would come too sweet and make Lazarus well again. But when Jesus got the word, he pretty much blew him off. He didn't immediately drop everything and flee to Bethany. He didn't even heal Lazarus long distance like he had for the Roman soldiers. Jesus stalled. He stayed two days longer until Lazarus was really, really dead. And Jesus knew he was dead. He told the disciples so, and he also said that he was glad he hadn't been there so that they would believe before telling them to pack up and start walking. They didn't want to go. It was already becoming dangerous for Jesus to move around, especially close to Jerusalem and the temple leaders. And furthermore, what was the point? Lazarus was dead, but Jesus was insistent, and Thomas, don't you just love him? Always practical, kind of like Martha, said, well, all righty then. If Jesus is determined to die, we might as well join him. So off they went to Bethany. As they neared the town, Martha came to meet them. Now, you never have to wonder what Martha's thinking, do you? Reminds me of some other women and men. I know and love. She pretty much enters a room mouth first. Seriously, Jesus, she's thinking, now you show up. What the heck? If you'd have been here a couple of days earlier, my brother wouldn't have died. This is no way for a savior to act, Jesus. But even now, even though I don't like the way that you're handling this, I believe. Martha is professing faith that she doesn't even understand herself. Faith that is unafraid to speak its mind, to cry to God, to lament, as the psalmist did earlier, and yet to know 
that Jesus is from God. So Jesus nods. He smiles as he gently bows down to look in her eyes. He tells her, your brother will live again. Martha's eyes roll. I know, Lord, someday. Fat lot of good that does us now. You know how the world is for widowed women. Women without protectors. What's going to happen to us? So Martha calls Mary, who always seems to be able to melt Jesus' heart. She comes with the family and friends who'd been with them since Lazarus died, and he, she falls at Jesus' feet, crying. Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Everyone is crying, so very, very sad. Scripture said Jesus was very disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He asked where they laid the body, and they, still weeping, said, Come and see. This is where Scripture says Jesus wept. He looked at the sisters he loved. He looked at the family and friends with them, and he wept. Why? The popular theory is that Jesus felt so badly for Mary and Martha and their friends that he mourned with them. In fact, that's the very message from the Spark Bible story that I posted for the kids yesterday. But if we look carefully at scripture, that's not the main reason Jesus wept. You see, Jesus knew Lazarus was dead. Jesus could have prevented it, but Jesus chose deliberately to delay it so that Lazarus would be dead. He came to awaken him. Now, why would Jesus feel bad for them if he knew he was going to lay the biggest surprise of their lives on them? Think about, oh, I don't know, a, a surprise party that you've planned for your parents' anniversary. You maybe tell them you're sorry you forgot and as you haul them along for groceries or other errands. You don't weep. You're excited. You can hardly keep the secret. You know the end of the story. The guests are gathering. There's a cake. There's a party. Jesus knew this party was coming. He had planned it since he first heard Lazarus was ill. He came deliberately late so that he could do this last huge miracle. Jesus knows the gift he is holding. He's excited to get there. And what is he greeted by? Accusation, tears, fear. Jesus wept because of their sorrow, yes. Because of their fear, yes. But in this case, those are secondary emotions. He wept because he saw what was causing the fear and the sorrow. Sin caused both. The same original sin we see throughout the Bible, beginning with Adam and Eve. Unbelief. These people had given up all hope. They had succumbed to the power of death, which they knew only as the final enemy, the place from which there was no, mis no escape. It was too late. And Jesus wept. But death may be a problem for us. It was a problem for Mary and Martha. But it's not a problem for Jesus. Jesus wept for the pain their sin had caused them, then took a deep breath, said, Take away the stone. Lazarus, come out. People of God, I know this is a fearful time, a fear filled, uncertain time. We don't know what's ahead of us. Our faith tells us Jesus is still Lord. He can heal, and if he does, we won't need to watch people in our state, in our county, in our town, sicken and perhaps even die like those in China and in Italy and in New York. But we don't know. We call on the Lord, and it seems he isn't coming. We yell at him, Lord, what the heck is this? We want to see our families who are sheltering in place. Older ones in nursing homes and younger ones in their own homes. We need to work. We need our paychecks. We need to buy groceries. We need to worship. 
Is this any way for a God to act, we ask? We cry, Lord, where are you? That fear is bottled up inside of us, sealed with a stone of unbelief. But Jesus, who called a four-day dead, rotting Lazarus to come out, calls you too with a call that echoes through the world even today. Jan, come out. Sharon, come out. Dave, come out. Put your own name in the blank now and say it with me. Come out. Come out. You can lament with the psalmist, but you're not stuck in it. You are unbound. The grave claws of fear and uncertainty have been removed. You are free from the tomb of your doubt. You are baptized. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. The resurrected Christ, full of power and grace, who came only, only that you might have life a fearless life of certainty and of peace. You are blood-bought sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let's get out there and live like it. Amen. And now until next time, may God keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue worship with the Apostles' Creed, and I invite you to say it with me right where you are. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, who will come again someday to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray now for the church, the world, and for all who are in need. This is a responsive prayer. I will end each petition with, Hear us, O God. You say, Your mercy is great. God of life, bind your faith-filled people into one body. Enliven us with your spirit and bless the work of those who strive for its renewal. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you love the world you have made, and you grieve when any part of your creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms, floods, wildfires, droughts, and other disasters. Bring all things to new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation those longing for wars to cease, those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize, those seeking election, and those in dire need of humanitarian relief. Come quickly with your hope. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for us to collaborate with our communities in caring for the needs of our neighbors. Help us in this time to be aware of need, and to give generously to those who are suffering in any way because of the strong measures taken to control the virus in our communities. Heal those who are ill, and please, come among us with your spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you are our resurrection. We remember all those who have died and trust that in you they will live again. Breathe now life into our dry bones that we too might live forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these and all our prayers as we commit them to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord smile upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a good week. Stay safe.